Hey everybody, welcome to Life is Vertical. I'm Anthony, and today's video I'm actually really excited about. Today we're going to talk about the greatest beer Super Bowl commercial of all time, the Budweiser Frogs. In 1995, Anheuser-Busch was going through a very interesting time period. They were losing out in the market to Miller with their amazing success of the Miller Lite. You know, it changed the game in the big beer world. Additionally, they were going through a transition of power where long-standing president August III was relinquishing his authority to August IV, his son. Now, August III was a very strict, very harsh, very cold, non-humorous, straightforward, business-minded type of person. And he really liked to focus his advertising campaigns on things like the tradition, the history of the family, and the techniques of what made Budweiser such a superior beer and why, you know, it's Beechwood aging made it so successful. Very clinical stuff. Interesting in a way, but very dry. However, in the 90s, things were rapidly changing. People wanted more inclusive, more entertaining, hilarious, that type of advertising. And AB3 just was not meeting it. But AB4 was a little bit more in touch. And he worked with a younger generation of beer marketers. And they were able to really nail down what made beer appealing to people. And sometimes it's nonsensical. So when the Super Bowl was coming up, he knew that he had to bring something big, something strong to the table that would really get everybody talking and get really interested in just discussing Budweiser. And although nobody's really sure exactly where the idea came from, they decided on frogs. They knew that it would resonate with younger drinkers, which is the most desirable demographic in the beer world. If you can get young drinkers on your team, you're guaranteed to make a profit. Now, this did confuse a lot of the older generation, the traditionalists, because it didn't have any bikini girls, it didn't have any iconic shots of a beer poured into an ice-cold glass, it didn't have any pictures of beer at all, no depictions of it at all in the commercial. But AB4 still believed that if he was able to execute it perfectly, it would make an impact. That September of 1995, all of Anheuser-Busch's top executives got together for a long drawn out multi-day executive meeting where they would go through all their future strategies, plans, and goals for the upcoming year. AB4 brought in David Swain, who was a very young beer marketing expert, basically. David presented a four-panel mock-up of the commercial, and accompanying it, he had basically the audio on a tape cassette player that he would play for the boardroom, and hopefully everybody would be intrigued and would love it. He got up, he showed the panels, he hit play, it played out the entire commercial, and when it ended, everyone was absolutely stunned in silence, all looking at AB3 at the head of the table wondering what he was going to say about this thing he just saw. Finally, after a few agonizing moments, AB3 took his hand off his face and said to the board, I don't get it. David Swain pleaded and begged with the board to let him try it one more time. And eventually they conceded and let him do it again, put up the postcard with all the images on it, hit play on the tape recorder, and again, everyone was silent. But eventually someone started laughing. The smile cracked, and eventually the whole boardroom, except for AB3, was dying of laughter, just rolling on the ground. Now, although AB3 still wasn't completely on board, despite the fact that the rest of the room seemed to be warming up to the weird, bizarre concept, the real fear that David Swain had was the asking price of the commercial coming in at $2.3 million. However, David Swain is a smart guy, and when he saw that he was starting to lose all hope in AB3, he said, but the majority of that money will be spent on making sure it is the first commercial aired during the Super Bowl. That is the most coveted slot. And that seemed to be enough to get AB3 on board. But before he would completely check up on it, AB3, he was known for having these cold, lifeless, pale, icy blue eyes, stared David Swain directly into his and said, are you willing to risk your career on this commercial? David Swain put up against the wall, had nothing else he could say, but yes. And that confidence, real or not, was all it took to get AB3 on board. If it worked, great, that's a huge success. If it didn't, 
he got to fire somebody, which is apparently something he really loved to do. So, in a way, it was a win-win for him. So, walking away from that executive meeting, David Swain and AB4 both knew this commercial had to be a success. AB3's ascension to power and David Swain's job literally relied on this. They threw everything that they had at this commercial. The production of the set as well as the animatronic frogs would cost nearly $1.2 million. So if they were going to spend this amount of money on basically robot frogs, they knew that they had to get the best in the game. So they hired the animatronic production team behind Jurassic Park. I mean, if you're going to want the best, you got to get the best. And I mean, that's who they got. Additionally, they got Gore Burbinsky to be the director of the commercial who went on to do things like The First Ring and a couple of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. So he wasn't a huge known name then, but I mean, look what he's done. His resume is pretty impressive nowadays. Additionally, it would require a team of puppeteers. The animatronic frogs, so they can move their mouths and eyes, but they still needed a team underneath that would be able to move their legs and bodies to be able to fit the right framing and everything. So. There was a lot that went into this. Now, another really cool thing about this is it was one of the first times you actually got to see uh, basically real life mocap because the guys who had that little controller that controlled their mouths wasn't actually like a hand controller. I don't know why I was making that gesture. It was more of a strap onto their head. So when they moved their mouths, the frog's mouths would move as well. That was innovative. That was very, very ambitious for that time. They began shooting the commercial that October on the former Phantom of the Opera set, which is pretty cool little fun fact. So they had everybody in place, director, all the actors and puppeteers underneath the stages. They started the audio track and you hear the crickets and then you zoom in on the frogs and the guy underneath would be like, what? <laughs> and they completely lip sync the entire video in tune with the audio track. Apparently a lot of people on set while all this weirdness was going on really started to lose faith in the product, including AB4 himself. I mean, they were all just looking around like, what the heck are we doing and how is this going to translate to selling beer? But a rough demo reel was sent out to focus test groups and it actually did extremely well. And that reinvigorated everybody on board to push out something that was going to be great, incredibly weird, and hopefully successful. The day of the Super Bowl, everybody was on the edge of their seats. AB3 had assembled all the executives together to watch the game. That way they could see what all their money was being spent on. And as the game faded to its first actual commercial break, it faded to black and slowly we started panning in on a swamp. And this is where we saw the greatest commercial. But, but, wise, but, but, wise, but, uh, but wise, but er, wise, but but wise, er, but wise, er, but wise, er, but wise, er. A bit weird, right? <laughs> but it was also incredibly successful. All the top polling sites said that it was the most memorative commercial to air during the entire Super Bowl. It was the commercial that people had the most callback to, and it was the commercial that had the most people talking about it. I mean, it literally went three for three in the top categories. And additionally, it was the most successful beer commercial in Budweiser's history. It outperformed the Clydesdales, it outperformed Spuds McKenzie, which is saying a lot. Advertising Age even said that it tripled the awareness of the Budweiser brand to younger drinkers. That's insane. Everybody, all the consumers, people who don't even like Budweiser, everybody was talking about it. They were all just sitting around at house parties being like, Bud, and somebody else was like, Wise, <laughs> you know? I mean, I remember, this was like my first beer commercial that I remember as a kid. And I remember like my uncles, my grandfather, my dad, all of them doing that around the house. We would go fishing and we'd hear frogs like uh, riveting or whatever it is they do out in the distance. And of course, somebody, one male member of my family would be like, <laughs> bud. And it just became a whole thing, you know. This was a huge staple in pop culture during the 90s. And because of this commercial, 
We actually saw sales of Budweiser skyrocket. Miller had been closing in on Budweiser with the success of Miller Lite, and Budweiser just rocketed off. I mean, the gap was immense. It solidified their position as king of beers before they even called themselves that. Without a doubt, it was a smash hit. AB3 was happy. AB4 was able to rise up the ranks. And David Swain was not fired. To capitalize on the success of their new mascots, Budweiser doubled down on this marketing campaign. All of a sudden, just all across the country, there was a mass influx of marketing and promotional materials, all advertising the different frogs. There were collectible memorabilia. I mean, everybody wanted to spend their money on some type of frog merchandise. But what was really interesting was that this was one of the first times that beer commercials truly had a storyline. I mean, with the Spuds McKenzie, we saw, you know, different situations, multiple appearances, him doing something goofy or wacky, but it didn't really tell a story. There was a no shit plot line for the Budweiser Frog, starting from that initial commercial, reaching all the way into their inevitable deaths. As time went on, as all things do, people started to lose interest in seeing the same thing over and over again, despite the fact that it was still a highly profitable and a highly successful advertising campaign. It just didn't really pull people in, but you know, that's how all pop culture is. So Anheuser knew that they needed to do something that would shake things up and get people talking about it again. So at the next Super Bowl, they decided that, so at the next Super Bowl, Anheuser decided that they were gonna introduce two scornful, angry, and jealous chameleons by the name of Louie and Frankie. Now, these chameleons would sit up in the trees and they would look down at the Budweiser frogs in the swamp and hear them do their little commercial advertisements and they would just be so angry and they would just talk shit about the frogs and talk about how they hated them and eventually talk about how they wanted to kill them off. That way they could take the spotlight. Budweiser. I can't Bud believe Bud they Bud went with the frogs. Bud Our audition was flawless. Bud we did the look. Huh? We did the tongue thing. Mm -hmm. That was great. Really, frog sell beer. Uh, That's it, man. Number one rule of marketing. The Budweiser lizards. We could have been huge. Hey, there'll be other auditions. Oh, yeah, for what? This was Budweiser, buddy. Enough. This was big. Those frogs are going to pay. Let it go, Louie. Let it go. Several commercials went by with Louie and Frankie just kind of talking and beating around the bush. But they decided that they were going to hire a ferret who would go out and actually act as a hitman and kill the frogs. Bud. Bud. What the? Whoa, whoa. I'm no electrician, but that has got to be dangerous. Oh my. Bud? Whoa. Louie. Frankie, eventually every frog has to croak. <laughs> That's not funny. I laugh when I'm sad. However, this coup was a little bit unsuccessful because as it turned out, the frogs actually survived. They were just suffering from pretty severe uh, electrical disfigurement as well as uh, some pretty severe PTSD. <laughs> Frankie, baby, I got some great news. What is it, Louie? The middle frog, mm -hmm. he's experiencing post-electroshock muscular irregularity. What? He's developed a nervous tick, Frank. He can't act anymore. It's horrible. Yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, Budweiser wants me to replace him. Have they lost their minds? All my hard work has paid off. Your hard work? Yeah, well, the auditions, you know, the drama classes. Yeah, Louie, you hired a hitman. With my own money, I might add. And that campaign kind of lasted for a little while, but eventually the chameleon got into a tongue-slapping fight with... Bud, the frog, and had to be replaced by the murderous ferret. However, Louis didn't take very kindly to this, so he started releasing sex tape scandal pictures and all that stuff about the ferret in hopes of getting him kicked out and taking his place back. Ladies and gentlemen, I have disturbing news about the ferret. What's this? In the summer of 79, the ferret posed nude. Oh, that's revolting. The photos were tasteless. Oh. They were vulgar. Oh, that's grotesque. And this one was just obscene. Hey, I know her. Eee. And I would like to ask for his resignation from this proud company called Budweiser. Now, what was he thinking? Yeah, there's one with a guinea pig that would make you pass out.
The 90s were uh, a wacky time to say the least. All in all, the Budweiser Frog campaign lasted six years. Over 41 televised commercials, as well as several radio appearances, and I mean, it's just insane. Unfortunately, in the 90s, Budweiser came under heavy scrutiny from anti-alcohol and parenting groups saying that these advertisements were directly targeting children. There was even a study that said that over 90% of kids under the drinking age and under their teenage years were able to identify, recognize, and recreate the commercials of the Budweiser Frog. So it might not have been targeted toward kids, but kids were exceptionally drawn to them. During the same time, the Clinton administration was cracking down on anything that could be targeted as a negative influence towards children, including tobacco, pornography, and alcohol. And of course, when that study crossed his desk, he decided that he was gonna crack down on them very hard. So to avoid all scrutiny and to get their advertising and their name out of the spotlight, Budweiser just decided the safest thing to do is just drop it before this escalated. The commercials became fewer and far in between and eventually just completely stopped in 2001 with one last radio commercial. However, in typical Budweiser fashion, they were like, oh no, nah, the, the whole demise of the frogs is greatly overstated. We just put them on the back burner so it's like, would it die out? You know, they wanted to keep them fresh for future generations. Although, that might be true to some extent because the actual voice recording studio that did the voices and the sound effects and everything for every single one of these commercials are still on retainer to Anheuser to this day. Additionally, over 20 years later, the Budweiser Frogs made a reappearance during the Super Bowl once again. Kind of. Instead of making their grand return to the Super Bowl, probably to avoid all that governmental scrutiny, they instead started appearing in the Bud Light's uh, debut marketing campaign in England. And this commercial was actually pretty cool, very nostalgic for me. It was almost a shot for a shot recreation of the original commercial with a few key differences. Light. Light. Beer. Light. It was really cool to see, you know, it really gave me that nostalgic vibe. It made me very happy to see that something from my childhood was still in a way relevant to this day. It was just really fun to see this. It didn't feel like fan service. It didn't feel like gimmicky marketing. It legit felt like somebody was interested in bringing back an iconic moment in beer history. Either way, the Budweiser Frogs, in my opinion, are the most iconic beer mascots to have ever existed. And they are certainly the most successful and the hardest driven beer commercial of all time. Without a doubt, I, I can't think of any other commercial campaign that has been so successful, so long lasting, and has made such an impact on pop culture still 30 years later after its initial conception. They were truly unique, truly interesting, and had just such an incredible story. I just really wanted to get out and tell you all about it. So that is my opinion on the greatest Super Bowl beer commercial of all time. If you have one that you think tops it, please let me know. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. And uh, tell me what your first thoughts were on the Budweiser Frogs or what your uh, first experience with them were because Mine was just such a very happy and personal connection that I had because I saw the commercial with my grandfather and I just, I don't know, it was kind of like a really cool special bonding moment with us. You know, I love seeing that man just like <laughs> choking up and laughing, not able to breathe. He was laughing so hard at these frogs. I mean, it was really cool. So let me know what your thoughts are. I would love to hear them. So thank you very much for watching everybody. I really hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something about this weird chunk of your beer history. So. Like, comment, subscribe, and remember, there's a story in every bottle, and that life is beautiful.